talking about the, Re the Reformation is very complex, and we kind of got up to how it spread into England, and it wasn't, it wasn't through anything, it had actually no theological basis in England whatsoever. There was no real sense of that any, either Lutheranism or Calvinism had taken root in England. You begin to have teachers show up at Cambridge and Oxford that were converts to it from the continent, and they had begun to teach some aspects of the challenge to the traditional Roman Catholic position. But there still is no, there's no theological reformation going on in England during the reign of Henry VIII. And the reason being is that Henry never renounces Catholicism. He's always a Catholic. He's always, you know, he's just, he may be a, a different kind of Catholic, but he's still a Catholic. Uh, he never wanted to change uh, the theology of the church. What he wanted to change was the headship of the church so he could get his own way. He wanted to, I mean, it's kind of strange. How do you, how do you, how do you have a Roman Catholic church when you eliminate, eliminate the Roman Catholic Pope? I mean, you know, but that's his deal. Try and move that over so that he can become the head of the church in England. Uh, it's a very different kind of reformation. It's one that's not understood by most Protestants. Today, most Protestants don't really look at the Anglican Church or the Church of England as being Protestant. They think it's a, still a form of Catholicism. It's not. Because the theology is going to change, but it doesn't change here. It changes uh, a generation later at uh, the time of, of, of Henry's young son, Edward. Edward is going to be the sixth. Edward the sixth is going to become uh, the tool to change the theology. Now, he's not a theologian by any means. But the Archbishop of Canterbury, who is alive at this time with Henry, it's Henry's recent appointment, wants to change the theology of the church because he is a Calvinist more than anything else. He knows Henry is not going to go for it, so he just remains silent on this on a number of issues, it's after Henry dies that he works with young Edward VI, who we haven't talked about at all because he hasn't, he's not been born yet. <clears throat> uh, but he's going to work with Edward VI to change the theology of the Church of England to a uh, definitely more Calvinist position, sort of midway between Calvinism and Lutheranism, and he's going to produce what, what, is the, what are the essential articles of the Church of England, they're called the, the first, in the first instance, they are called the 42 Articles, and eventually they're going to be known as the 39 Articles, and you're going to have a new Book of Common Prayer, which will not be in Latin, but in English. I mean, there'll be some significant changes going on. Uh, Protestants today, particularly Baptists, who just go, <coughs> They're just sure the Church of England is nothing but, but sheer uh, Catholic heresy. How many, any Baptists in here, just for the hell of it? You want to admit it? Okay, now that I've said this. Okay. Um, this is stuff that I kind of grew up with. I know all about it. You know, you know life. Uh, Church of England has a very historic, significant position in the Reformation. But it comes about very differently. It's not a challenge to walk by faith and not accept you know, the dictums of the church. That doesn't show up. It's not a challenge of sola scriptura like Martin Luther, scripture only and all that. It's not, it's nothing, there's nothing glamorous about it. It's Henry wants a change of wife. Okay? That is kind of the, even though that sounds really like, I mean, that's, shallow the ramifications to wanting that change is not is going to be anything but shallow it's very complex okay so he sends his his right hand man he sends the first minister basically prelude to prime minister you don't really have prime ministers yet but he sends his first minister cardinal wolsey i asked i told you before wolsey is a is a cardinal of the church why is this guy also Henry's minister? Because he can read and write. Because he can read and write. He's literate. 
And you've got to pull from the ranks of the clergy to, or from the nobility, and usually clergy and nobility, were, they're not separate. Many of the time, the nobility were from the ranks of the clergy, and the clergy were the educated, they would had some training, particularly in Latin, uh, certainly more training than a lot of people had. That's changing slowly because of the Renaissance. More learning is coming into the country, more learning as it is all over Europe. But you still have this, this great uh, movement of in terms of changing some of this stuff. And so you have uh, men like Wolsey, it happens a lot, secular authority, church authority, and that was a pretty, pretty, that was a pretty long-term tradition in England. I'll give you an example of the biggest, the, one of the biggest ones that, that have happened. Back in the 13th century, you had Henry II, okay, and he appointed as his chancellor, his, one of his first ministers, uh, a young man named Thomas Beckett. Now, later, he decides to appoint Beckett as Archbishop of Canterbury. Beckett says, don't do it. I, my loyalty, if you do that, is going to be to the church and to the Pope, not to you. But he thought he could use Beckett because he was, these guys were tight partners when they grew up. As they used to say, they would, they would go out winching together. Do I need to explain this? <laughs> Eat, drink, and be bewitched. <laughs> anyway, they, they did a lot of good stuff. Well, they've done a lot of stuff on the John the Good But if you want to, if you want to see a well done presentation on that, see the movie Beckett. Yeah. It's phenomenal. It goes back to an earlier period, which is why I won't try to show it in this class, but it is probably one of the finest movies really ever made, uh, I think. Um, how did, how's the response in England back then? Did you ever see it? No, no, no. It's, it's no. way it's before you, maybe before you were born, but everybody else in this class, too, except me. Well, not me, not me. Not the big three up here in the front, yeah, but the unholy trinity are right here. Okay. <laughs> so um, he gets into a major battle with Beckett because Beckett now decides to, uh, to take that position uh, to use against Henry. In the end, Henry winds up murdering Becket at the altar of uh, altar of the cathedral, Canterbury Cathedral. Becket becomes a martyr, and Becket becomes a uh, a major a major figure in English church history. But he's a martyr to the Catholic faith. Henry looks like dog meat after this. Uh, Becket becomes a shrine. And Canterbury Tales comes out of the pilgrimage that people make to the to the shrine of Canterbury to visit uh, the relics of Thomas Becket, Archbishop of Canterbury. There, there, there's been a lot of that kind of stuff, that collision between church and state in England over the years. So now we get down to it again. Uh, Wolsey is not Archbishop, but Wolsey is a representative of Henry. Henry wants a divorce. You can't really have a divorce in the Catholic Church. Because, why? Why can't you have one? It's a sacrament. It's a sacrament. The sacrament is what? Considered what? Well, it's sacred, yeah. Indissoluble. You can't dissolve it. Unless by death. If one of the two of you dies, yay. Anyway, <laughs> then you can have your sacrament dissolved. Okay. But then once that happens, for you to get married again requires a special dispensation on the part of the church. Okay? So that being said, he sends Wolsey, his right-hand man. Wolsey had done everything that Henry VIII wanted, whatever it was. Including, I mean, his own his own uh, conniving to confiscate the property of the great monasteries in England to raise money. I mean, Wolsey even engineered some of this stuff. And Wolsey is a cardinal of the church, 
So these guys would, would, you know, for the sake of power, for the sake of prestige, for the sake of what they were getting out of it, would do whatever they had to do. There's just a lot of crossover here. He now sends Woolsey 1828 to 1530, sends him to Rome to negotiate with Pope Clement VII to get Henry VIII, knows he can't get a divorce, but to get what everybody else could get it, that had enough money to do it that was done at the time, and that is get an annulment to this marriage with Catherine of Aragon. Using the argument that, so you understand this again, using the argument that the marriage has been cursed, I only have a daughter, it's been cursed because I married my brother's wife. I slept with my brother's wife. He said, therefore, and that's a violation of one of the commandments in the book of Leviticus. I mean, you've got it, it's a stretch. It's really taking this out of context. Basically, what he did deal with was the fact that he had been, this was an arranged marriage when he was a kid. Uh, his the, the, the older brother Arthur is the one who was first married Catherine of Aragon as a state marriage, political marriage. Uh, he dies really young, and so Henry is, is now the, main, the point man for Henry VII to say, okay, now you're going to marry Catherine of Aragon to keep this alliance going. Why? Because the big threat we all face, the big one we really don't like, and we don't like just on general principle, are the French. Okay? What? Because the French. <laughs> I don't know where you guys are getting your American history, but I know the French saved our ass during the American Revolution. Okay? Yeah. Keep it in mind. Motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> well the French did. I mean they just pardon me, you they're gonna pay me they're gonna pay me this month? No. Um but keep that thing in mind. Um, so Henry now sends Wolsey to do this, the dirty work, Clement VII. You know, there's an expression of location, location, location. Well, in the case of history, it's not location. Timing, timing, timing. Timing is everything. Clement VII is under house arrest in the city of Rome by the emperor at the time, the, the emperor of everything, who is this? Charles. Charles V. He runs almost all of Europe. Huge. And his army is in Rome, and Clement VII is under house arrest. He happens to be what? The nephew of Catherine of Aragon. He is the nephew of Catherine of Aragon. Sound like an echo in here? Yeah. <laughs> but he is, and he, he's going to, he's bad news. Wolsey can't get, can't win the day. Annulments were not common, but they were given, and typically, even at this time, annulments were given, but not when you are a captive under house arrest. And the Charles V has an army guarding basically what is the Vatican area. You're not going to make a stupid mistake by granting Henry an annulment. Catherine. Otherwise, Henry's going to keep, he's going to really make you suffer for, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Charles is going to make you suffer for a long time. And he had the power to do it, yes. Who made up the army? Hmm? This is like a multi- It's a multinational army. army. It's made up of, um, you had um, Germans, Austrians, uh, you had Italians, and you had essentially uh, Dutch in this army, some Spanish. About a hundred thousand man army. They weren't all in Rome because it didn't. I mean, the Pope wasn't exactly a major military force. Uh, basically, he was going to pray against you, but you're not worried. About it. <laughs> okay. So, but it's the timing. Wolsey came back empty-handed. Henry. Now you get to now you get to, to meet the man, the personality, the, the way this guy is. Henry doesn't give a crap about Woolsey's excuses and the fact that this guy, uh, that the Pope is under house arrest to Charles. And 
we'll, we'll kill him. A lot of folks were murdered. And he was, this is a period of time when anything could happen under house arrest, and he's not going to grant an annulment. Woolsey came back failing in his assignment. Henry's response is, Woolsey is accused of treason for failing to deliver. Oh, come on. I mean, this is the, ridiculous. I mean, it's really ridiculous. It's like trying to, you know, work out a deal with the Tea Party. <laughs> They're going to kill Bamber if he backs down, you know? I throw a political joke. I get all this Democratic stuff on my email every day, tons of it. They want money for every little nasty little piece of shit that goes on. Oh, jeez. Three bucks here, five bucks here, 35 bucks. There. I'm not going to. I may side with him on some positions, but I'm not sending money. Thank you. All right. Um, but you, you really have this situation where he is, you know, he's accused of treason. His property is seized. He's going to be brought to court in 1530. The royal court on the issue of treason and the rest of it, I mean, he's being charged with it. And on the way to the court procedure, he simply dies of a heart attack. He's way overweight anyway, and he dies on his horse going to, going to trial. Uh, a sad ending for a polit political sycophant. Sycophant meaning someone who is a, basically a kiss ass. Um, <laughs> but, you know, he'll do it. But, they, but it's, it is. One of the pieces of property that Henry seized later becomes uh, his personal property, Henry's personal property. I think he liked property, that's one of the reasons. It's just, just it's still within, I think, the framework of London, They're very close. Hampton Court Palace, yes? I was curious, the video made it sound like Wolf was <coughs> responsible for some positive things while he was minister. It was. Book, kind of said he was basically <coughs> as well as kind of connect legacy. I think Wolsey has been, uh, I think he looked, he's looked at it as a victim, as much as anything. Uh, not a hero, but a victim. Um, he's looked at as being a little corrupt. But he wasn't. You know, uh, I don't get a sense of being overly corrupt, but a little bit corrupt. But he sort of sold himself out to the king in order, in order to gain the king's pleasure. And if that meant uh, selling out the monasteries, which he did, agreeing to the king's seizure of the monasteries, which is totally to uh, being a focused Catholic, that's the wrong thing to do. But he's, he's, kind of a, he's kind of a mixed bag. He's a sell-off in one way, but he's considered also very courageous in other ways. Uh, a good first minister, because he was trying to be loyal to the king. And then in the end, he gets, he gets screwed. Because Henry, Henry is not a man to be trusted. Henry is violent, has a violent temper. And it shows both that he wants what he wants when he wants it. So with that, that doesn't answer the question totally, but it's, it's the best, best I can do with, with Woolsey. Was he one that helped develop the balance of power? Yes, he is. He's the one that did. This is a, great, this is a big asset. Balance of power is the big thing, doctrine that he developed. And I think we didn't go over it, but essentially that's, you know, to side with any country in Europe that's at war with a country that wants to dominate Europe. And the British have held with that ever since. I mean, this, is, this is really a strong position. It brought England into World War One. It brought England into the Napoleonic Wars, World War One, eventually World War Two. Uh, and uh, they've been very—I mean, they're very faithful to this. It, it means something. It means something. Um, our politics today are so all over, the, all over the ticket. Uh, it's hard to know what the hell anybody means here in this country. I mean, it shifts with political parties, it shifts with, if you're dealing with neocons, it shifts if you're dealing with no matter what. It's just constantly, you know, it's not even pragmatic anymore. It's just bizarre. Uh, balance of power is a very, very firm doctrine. It's still, it's still there. <clears throat> okay. Uh, probably not on the scale that it was, but they're not dealing with issues of that scale either right now. Okay, so, uh, but it's, it works, it works. Um, and that was Woolsey, Woolsey's doctrine. Now, moving back to the church thing, he is, he 
dies, has a heart attack on the way to the, on the, way to the, uh, the trial, who knows what he's facing. He, and in the process, Hampton Court Palace, which is his personal, his personal estate, was seized by Henry. And you can, that today is just not, you can see it in London, you're in London, it's like 15 minutes on the tube to get to it. It's a, it's a neat place. Um, it's, you're right on the, you're right on the river. And, but it's just, a, it's just a little outside of the mainstream of London. So you kind of, you're kind of in the country, a little, not country, but you're, you're just out of ways. Beautiful, beautiful. Anybody been there? You've been there? Okay. Uh, yeah. This is where, uh, I mean, this is where Henry's going to do a lot of persuasion. And we saw a bit of that in the, in the film. All right. Um, but now something has to change. Fifteen thirty-three. Thomas Cranmer, C R A N M E R, Archbishop of Canterbury, does something rather interesting. He grants Henry; he's the Archbishop. Grants Henry a divorce from Catherine through the English church court, which is called an ecclesiastical court. How does that happen? How do you get a divorce? Strange. It, when you look at that, it doesn't make a lot of sense because the church doesn't recognize divorce. Why would the church, the Catholic church in England, even though it may be stepping away from the Pope, suddenly recognize divorce? Well, this is just a political guess. Craig Amor knew that uh, if, he, if he gave Henry what he wanted, he would be like, hey, I could be your new first minister and get in mm -hmm. and get into a very strong political position. That's a that's a good point. That's a good point. You could have, you could have. Uh, Cramner never seemed to me to be politically ambitious. Uh, he's always in the background. But I think, but Cramner is a theologian. He's a very good one. And I think what he's trying to do is set up the a formula to bring about a theological reformation in England, and the step is away from looking at, at marriage as a sacrament. Now, he doesn't say this any place, because it would have been just much more sensible to grant an annulment. Yeah. But why a divorce? You don't even have divorce on the books yet. They haven't separated from Rome in that sense at all. So it's, it's, it, it is, it, it's, it's unique. So he grants, he in a way, gives them a divorce through the English church court. What basically the other thing that it's saying here is that the English church court is the highest church court that anybody in England is going to be able to go through. Yeah. You're not going to be able to go any higher. You're not going to be able to circumvent the Archbishop of Canterbury on these issues. You're going to have to, this is as far as it goes. You can't appeal to the Pope. It ain't going to work. We don't, we're not dealing with the Pope anymore. Okay. 1533. In September of that year, 33, his new wife, Queen Anne Boleyn, gives birth to the child, Elizabeth. Uh, it was going to be Elizabeth I. But there's a whole lot of work that has to be done here. <clears throat> What we look at now is the steps toward changing England from its Catholic position to becoming a Protestant church or a state church. It's called the Act of Supremacy. <clears throat> Started back in 1530. Henry called on Parliament to help him meet the crisis 
about the succession, the marriage, and the succession, the crisis with Rome, and all that stuff. You had convened a committee to meet together with a committee of parliament to meet, go into this whole discussion, and decide what to do now that Wolsey's blown it, Wolsey's dead, calls on parliament to support me in this. Now, people that know Henry know that you don't want to argue with it. Parliament, members of parliament whose families are basically nouveau parliamentarians, nouveau nobility appointed by Henry VII a generation earlier are not going to have a conflict with Henry VIII. They don't want that. No matter what their religious beliefs are, they don't want to have a conflict with Henry VIII. Henry VIII is a different temperament than his dad. Henry will find a way to execute you. No matter what your legal st stance is, you don't want to argue with Henry. Everybody knew that. Okay. <clears throat> So he wants, to, he wants to bring about the complete separation of the church in England from Rome. He does not want to change the theology of the church. He's still a Catholic. He still has the title defender of the faith, as do English monarchs today. That's defender of the Catholic faith. Okay? The first series of acts leading to the final act of supremacy it's called the Act of Anates, A-N-N-A-T-E-S, 1532. In that particular act, typically in the spring, the first fruits of the land, the first fruits of the harvest, have traditionally been given to the church, to the Pope. That means for sale of lamps, sale of cattle, sales of wheat, whatever. First fruits given to the Pope. The yearly act, annotates. It's now changed that the first fruits of the land will be given to Henry. Who signed on? The question is, who didn't? <clears throat> Nobody did not sign on. Under the same rubric, uh, all appointment of bishops in the land would be done by Henry, not by the Pope. That's just absolutely off the charts. All the higher clergy in England will now be dictated by the king, not by the Pope. So brother, whoever has the power to appoint a bishop <clears throat> to do your bidding, Whatever power the church thought it had in England, whatever church power the church of, that is the Catholic Church in Rome, thought it had, it's now over with. You no longer can appoint your own bishops, your own people to represent your own point of view. There will be no appeal after this. The appeal, Act of Appeals, 1533, no appeals after, once it's gone to the Archbishop of Canterbury. Cannot go. You can't, I don't care what your case is, what your problem is. Can't be able to appeal to the Pope. The Pope is just not recognized any longer as the authority in England. It's the Archbishop of Canada. If you try to appeal beyond the Archbishop, arrest and confiscation of property, execution, it's treason. Henry's forcing his way through it. The final act of supremacy in 1534-35 <coughs> made Henry VIII the supreme head of the church in England. Papal authority in England as it is at an end. 1534 and 35. Papal authority in England as it is at an end. That same year in 35, the act of succession legitimizes Anne Boleyn's daughter, Elizabeth, as the heir apparent to the throne. Now, uh, 
And it also declares Mary, daughter of Catherine of Aragon, to be illegitimate. Now these guys are stepping way over the bounds. This is Parliament. Parliament's being driven to these things. And nobody is going to revolt against this because nobody wants to lose their life and then nobody wants to lose their property. Henry is dictating this. And people, okay, a lot of this has, it's based on Henry's personality. He doesn't seem to be afraid of a damn thing. <laughs> There's no member, nobody has private armies running around anymore. So you can't just, what, fill up the boat, pull up the drawbridge, and let your army say, fuck, we're not going to do it. <laughs> can't do that. Can't do it anymore. That ended a generation earlier. So nobody's, nobody can do this. They're all vulnerable. And Henry knows it. By all of these acts, you put them all together, what you have is the creation of the Anglican Church, the church in England or the church of England, as a separate communion from the Catholic Church in Rome. It's a national or state church. That really has not come about anywhere else in Europe in quite the same way. National or state church. With the crown and not the pope as the head. There's a little glitch in the system. <clears throat> one guy who steps up to the plate who just would not bow to him and his name is Sir Thomas More M just oh, M -O -R -E. he's the author of a very famous renaissance work called Utopia yeah, yeah great book yeah uh, it's a work, it's, a, it's brilliant. Yeah. He's also Henry's chancellor. He's not a clergyman. He's Henry's chancellor. What is the chancellor at the time? It's basically used for one who would be like the Supreme Court Justice. Highest lawgiver in the land. Interpreted all laws. Everything legal is in the hands of this man. He's rendered hundreds of judgments over his, year, over his years as chancellor. He has a reputation for great honesty, <clears throat> great integrity, never took a bribe. Boy, in an age when everybody was on the take, he never took a bribe. And he looks at what Henry is doing and he is, Sir Thomas More, is really offended by Henry's collision with the Pope. Thomas More is a Catholic in good standing. He's a Catholic who supports the papacy. And he will not, he does not, and all he will not swear the act of allegiance to the act of either the act of succession or the act of supremacy. Henry's mandated that everybody in the court, everybody in his cabinet, everybody in Parliament will sign the act of supremacy making him head of the church in England. Thomas More refused to sign. But he never spoke against the king. He never spoke against the marriage. He never spoke against Henry becoming supreme in England, supreme over the church in England. He never spoke against it. Why? He doesn't have to. He knows English law. He knows it well, and he says, I have never spoken against the king. I have never spoken against what he's done here. I'm not going to speak against what the king has done here. I'm going to maintain my legal position of silence, for which no one can construe from silence that I am against the king if I have never said I'm against the king. He's taken a legal position of using silence in, in his defense. 
in English law at the time, this was perfectly justified. But you know the expression, the silence is deafening. His silence didn't matter. Henry said, yeah, I mean, you know, come on. Come on, just sign this. Sign the act of supremacy. It just looks bad, you know? Bad for business. Bad for kings, bad for crowns, bad for what I've done. His silence makes the whole thing look like a, a total charade. It just undercuts everything Henry's done. Not that Sir Thomas More is trying to do that. He's just simply saying, I am not, but I but everybody's looking at Moore saying, he's, hey, by the way, he's the only one that hasn't signed the Act of Supremacy. And nobody would let Moore forget it. Everybody went to Moore and said, you can't, you can't do this. You're going to sacrifice your life, the life of your family, your wife, everybody. You lose your estates. It's all going to go if you don't do this. You've got to know that. He says, I cannot be convicted on silence. Now, this is an honest man didn't matter, Henry said, okay, enough is enough. You stand out like a sore thumb, you're to be arrested. And he's, he's arrested. <coughs> he resigned his office in 1533, refusing. He remained silent on the king's divorce, never said a word to it to anybody. Just to quote him here, for this my silence, neither your law nor any law in the world is to just, justly and rightly punish me. Why would he say something like that? I mean, what authority does he have for this? The law of the land. He knows the law. He's interpreted the law. He's, the, he's basically, it's like you have the Supreme Court justice on trial for violating the law. He says, I know the law, and you're wrong. You can't convict him. But he's dealing, with, he's dealing with Henry. Henry gets what Henry wants. What he wants. The law was on his side, but the king's against him. And that means it's a one-sided contest. Um, Henry frames him. Sends him to court. Henry will not appear at the court. He has his own ministers testify against Sir Thomas More. They can't find anything wrong with him. It looks like they're going to have to go down with a major acquittal. Parliament can't bust his testimony. Nobody can. He's done nothing wrong. He simply stands out like a sore thumb, which is wonderful the way this went. To some. But then there was somebody that showed up and testified that he saw him take a bribe. And this was a young man who was on the move, on, on the way up, Richard Rich. And Richard said, yes, I will, I will testify. I saw him take a bribe. The lady gave him a piece of, big piece of silver, like a candelabra. And I saw him take it. What he didn't add was that Sir Thomas More had it. This lady put it in his hand. He threw it in the Thames. Didn't want it. Would never take a bribe. But Richard Rich said that he also heard him testify against Henry's divorce and against Henry be becoming the supreme pontiff of the church in England which Moore never, never, ever said. And Henry, I mean, and, and at this point, Sir Thomas Moore was absolutely stunned in court that this guy would testify to this. Total, total lie. Parliament knew it was a lie because they had put him up to it. They worked with him on it. These are your lines, this is what you have to say. 
How many parliamentarians do you think really wanted to go along with this? Probably not very many. They're killing the, the, the really one courageous, honest man that's standing up to Henry VIII here. So Henry sends him to court, finds somebody to play direct to, to lie against him, accuse Thomas More of treason, doesn't support the act of supremacy. He spoke against the king's marriage, spoke against the king's supremacy, all that stuff. And knowing Richard Rich, because Sir Thomas More knew him over the last five years, and had experiences with him, didn't, wouldn't work with him, wouldn't hire him. He wanted to be a lawyer and wanted also to become a justice himself. And he refused to, he just thought this is a guy that's just too ambitious and he really wouldn't, wouldn't work with him at all. In the end, Rich shows up at court and testifying against him because he's bitter. And in the, in the testimony, he looks at Rich and he says, you know, do you honestly think after all these years of pleading silence and saying nothing about the king's divorce and saying nothing about the act of supremacy, that I would say these things to you? Of course not. I don't like you, I don't trust you, I mean, I would never talk to you about any of these things. And he says this in open court, and so in the end, he's, he reaches and he grabs a medal on his neck around Richard Rich's neck. He pulls it off, he's, he's Richard Rich has been made. Chancellor of Wales by Parliament, by because through the king. And one of the comments that comes out of this thing that, that shows up. By the way, this is this is redone so well in, in the movie. A man for all seasons. Anybody oh, yeah. ever? How, how many have you never seen that? Never. What is it called? Man, a man for all seasons. Yeah. It's great. They did a re they did a re I, they did it again. I don't know why they did it. It was awful, but they the original one. Had, uh, oh God, I forgot. What, Henry the, uh, Robert Shaw played Henry the Eighth. Remember Robert Shaw? Anybody? Shark and Hands from Jaws. Okay, and um, he was the killer in the second James Bond movie, Russian from Love. Robert Shaw, good actor. And then Paul Schofield played. Um, Sir Thomas More. He just he just passed away about this, within this last year. Um, I think what I'll do is bring up if I can find it. I can go to DJ's so and get a, uh, some of that to show on, on uh, Wednesday. A little bit of that trial. Okay. Um, he sees the he pulls out he pulls out that chain with you know the insignia of Wales on it been made essentially Chancellor of Wales. And his comment to him, based on the records, the movie also has it down too. He says, what shall it gain a man, you know, to gain the whole world and lose his own soul. And he pulls out the thing and says, but for whales? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's wonderful. Okay. So that's the end of it. He's going to be taken for trial and executed on the scaffold of the Tower of London. And on the tower, he is a very brief comment. Henry is reportedly within earshot to hear this. Uh. I wish no one evil, I speak no one evil, I do no one evil, but if I die, I die the king's good servant, but God's first. Boom, that's a ton of bricks. I wish no man evil, I speak no one evil. <coughs> I do know one evil, and if I die, I die the king's good servant, but God's first. Henry, you've had it. 
and he was executed. And there goes the, the great martyr of the English Reformation. Henry never forgot this, and the public never forgot it either. Henry then issued what's called the Six Acts, A-C-T-S. Six Acts. Defending the church in terms of doctrine. But then Henry's life is just starting with all of the interesting um, avenues of sexual innu innuendo and everything else that he's got going on. He's going to go through six wives before all this is over. So let's take a look and see who we're dealing with here. Catherine. Marriage. Annulled and divorced, depending on how you take it. She gave birth to Mary. Then we have Anne Boleyn, who lived only three years. She's executed for treason. And again, movies on that. There's a great little movie out called Anne of a Thousand Days. Anne of a Thousand Days. There have been some great movies made about this period. She's executed after three years. Elizabeth is written in and out of the will again. Catherine's written in and out of the will again with her daughter Mary. So nobody knows where any of this is going to go. He then marries Jane Seymour. With Jane, she has his only son, Edward VI, Jane Seymour. She dies giving childbirth. And then he married Anne of Clives from Germany, whom he divorced for being ugly. Jeez. There's no treason. <laughs> Just go away. He married her ugly body. Well, he got this picture of her painted by the artist at the time, did a lot of court artists, art, and that's Holbein. H-O-L-B-E-I-N. Holbein was a court artist in Austria, court artist in, for the English, the French, he did a lot of stuff. But he really, but he also, what? He jazzed up the portraits. You know, she looked really cute, and, you know, hot to trot. Henry's always hot to trot, he's never cute. But she shows up in court, he about croaked. <laughs> so that was it. You know, I, I, Meanwhile, you know, can you see the Archbishop of Canterbury just going crazy with this stuff? Yeah. You know, he's now on a roll of divorcing <laughs> right. or annulling marriages, you know, just based on you're ugly. And so, um, <laughs> it just goes on and on. So, anyway. Yeah, that's Anna Clive. He sends her back to Germany in a box. <laughs> <laughs> then comes Catherine Howard. Executed for treason. Well, she was flirting with some of the court musicians. I mean, you know. And then finally, Catherine Parr, who was late middle aged, didn't wasn't about. She does she doesn't mess around. She was fairly decent looking, but she outlived Henry. Henry had gotten himself into a really bad. I'd say. Uh, into some real physical difficulty when he decided in his middle years to go to do a joust. Jousting. And he got knocked off his horse and got the crap knocked out of him. And he was never the same since. He died about five years later. So, end of Henry. By 49. You're 1549. It's over for Henry. He's got nothing going on here. And, but he's got this whole church issue. He's got, Parliament has come together again to try to figure out who should rule. But there's no question, Henry has a son. So the dynastic question is at an end for a while. The son is born, this means the son is going to become the new king. How old is the new king? He's about 10 years old. Yeah. Edward VI. But he's a male heir. And people respect that part of it, so he, okay, well and good. <clears throat> In 
it's under Edward, who's only going to reign for about another nine years. His years are very interesting. He's, you know, he's parallel of all things to uh, in terms of when he becomes king and when he dies, which is very young, both things very young. Very parallel to actually King Tutankhamun in Egypt. Only lived to be about 18, 19. And they died. Only became ruler when he was about 9 or 10. Very, very strange little, not had nothing to do with anything else. No relation, of course. But it always reminds me of the same thing. Yeah. Now, uh, now England has the theological reformation under Thomas Cranmer through the reign of Edward VI. Okay. Start off with preludes to this English Reformation. Why does it change? Why does the theology change? And uh, we have enough time. I'll show a little bit of the film I started last week uh, with uh, the movement of uh, toward Catholicism. We started off with Simon Shama showing uh, the change in the Catholic Church into uh, the beginnings of Protestantism in England and how that happens. We'll pick that up in a minute. Okay. Uh, the 14th century had two, I've already talked about this briefly, but you had two individuals that led a real revolt in the church in England. That's uh, William Tyndale, T-Y-N-D-A-L-E, Tyndale, and John Wycliffe, W-Y-C-L-I-F-F-E, uh, for whom a group of Bible translators today can take their name, the Wycliffe Bible Translators, I don't think anybody's ever heard of them. They've gone all over the world translating the scriptures into uh, all kinds of indigenous tongues. Probably something like 200 translations at least. Uh, I've known kids that I grew up with and the Wycliffe translators and stuff spend their whole lives doing just that. Uh, these two believed in the reading of scripture in church. That it was absolutely uh, anti-Catholic. Catholic Church never allowed anything but authorized versions to be read in church or to be ever be printed. Uh, and that was always in Latin, and it was in the Latin of St. Jerome, the Latin Vulgate, which was first drawn up in the late 4th, early 5th centuries. It became a dead language in the church, or it became a dead language in Europe, because within a century, Europe changed hands from the Germanic invasions. That left the Catholic Church still using the language of ancient Rome, and the translation of Jerome, who meant his translation to be given to all, all Christians, uh, because it was the language of ancient Rome that they could all read it. That he wasn't trying to write a mystery language. He did it for everybody. Jerome's Latin Vulgate, the vulgar language. But then the vulgar language became an obscure language, and nobody could read it any longer. So now the, the church has taken the position that everything is going to be in Latin, no matter what. So the purpose of Jerome is sort of pushed away. People couldn't read Latin. It didn't matter the church was going to use Latin. It's the language of the sacred text, the Latin Vulgate. OK, that, be, that was true right until the 16th century. These guys will step in in the 14th, try to change this, write tra treatises and tracts in English, bits and pieces of scripture into, into Middle English, uh, and with great success. People love it. It's going to be read in churches. So you have the beginnings of a challenge to Rome, Rome's authority. Uh, you have, because people bought this stuff, a real beginning of an educated Protestantism, because they could read and write. It, it, they learned how to read and write in order to do just this. Um, Probably the one thing that nobody thinks about in regards to this, why the church split, is that one of the great theological debates that came about in the 12th and early 13th century, it was way back, was Pope Gregory VII enforcing the rule of clerical celibacy on all of the priesthood. Now what I'm talking about here is the only clergy 
that were celibate up until the 12th century. The only clergy that were, were, there were, there were and they did it voluntarily, were those that belonged to the, all the monastic orders. The Benedictines, the Augustinians, Franciscans, didn't matter. These were all, every one of them took the vow of poverty, obedience, and above all, chastity, no sex. In order to protect the church from the state, Gregory VII decided that if the parish clergy were forbidden to marry, then whenever the church had a problem with the state, any state, no matter who it was, any monarch, that the monarch could not seize the family of a priest or a bishop and torture them. Because if they don't have a family, they can't be intimidated. And it also results in what, what's created is it's a clerical celibacy is considered a spiritual high mark. It was something that was done for the for the monks. It was an, an honor to do it, and therefore it needs to be enforced on the parish priest as well. And so it was with Gregory the Seventh. And so that starts really in the 13th century, big time. Nobody liked it. Nobody wanted to do it, but they're all forced to do it. There's a real issue here of trying to get it enforced. But England is across the water. And it was less than a century prior to Henry VIII that celibacy was ever enforced in England. And they still didn't do it. When they did do it, finally, when they're forced to do it, they find another way out. You can always find a hooker. <laughs> so, you disobey one commandment to support a church commandment, kind of the way it went, and the parish priests in England were the last ones to ever, ever succumb to this. And they had barely done it. They were still resenting it, really pissed about it, when, in fact, <coughs> along comes the Reformation in England. It helps promote an attitude of resentment to what Rome had done, Rome's di dictatorial power. Now, everybody's at fault here. There's nobody that's... that's that's free of fault. Cranmer now becomes, who was Archbishop of Canterbury under Henry, now is free to begin to change things. He's a pretty serious scholar. One of the first acts that he does during the reign of Edward VI is the Book of Common Prayer, published in 1549 right at the beginning of Henry's reign, right at the beginning of Henry's reign. Book of Common Prayer in the English language. No longer a prayer book in Latin, it's in the English language. And it was to be used and read uniformly throughout England, everywhere in England, all the same in all the churches. So it's going to be promoted through the Act, act of Uniformity in 1549 as well, yes. Did Kramer essentially run Edward's uh, kingship? Did he what? Did he run it? Because Edward seems like he was too young. To he is too young. He really doesn't understand much of it. At least, I mean, that's that's probably the consensus of opinion that Kramer Kramer did do do this. He ran the show. He's not a forceful character. Uh, there are others there that are more forceful, like Bishop Latimer. But uh, still, Edward it is. He's young. He's too young to really, I think, get him get on with all this stuff. Doesn't really uh, he then wrote the 42 Articles of, in the year 1553, 42 Articles of the Anglican Church, uh, with probably too much emphasis on what on Calvin's theology. But it's a very it's a very well stated theological position. If you can state a good theological position, just 
42 articles, you're doing something. Because for Calvin to state his position, it took him two volumes. Calvin's always very wordy, very legal, very black and white. And uh, something very explosive about what Calvin can say. Uh, Cramner's just very balanced judgment. And that's a best position of a lot of theologians today, whether they agree with it or not. They look at they look at who the reformers. Luther's very bombastic. Calvin's very legalistic, and in Cranmer, he's sort of in the middle, and he has a, a good scholarly approach to, to handling these very difficult theological issues. So he's got the Book of Common Prayer in Latin, uh, pardon me, in English, spread throughout the area. Uh, you can't have a separate book that you're going to use, and one in Latin. It ain't going to work. This is the Church of England now, and then finally uh, the, the 42 Articles some of which are more Calvinistic articles than other, a little too much on predestination, all that stuff in Calvin. And it's modified later under Queen Elizabeth uh, as 39 articles. Okay, uh, it's really a, the theological reformation. 